am dr uh, professor ashok kumar agarwal uh, former director school of health sciences igno and presently working also as part time advisor advisor with astron institute of international studies and uh, we have with us uh, a large number of students and then dr neeru bhatia madam uh, who is the architect of uh, the astron institute and uh, ms polomi vikram ji and all the staff so the e college you know this is a, this is the the astron institute uh, is one of the first institute in the country to be accredited by nabet which is the national accreditation board for education and training and uh, it was done uh, recently about 6 uh, to 8 months or 9 months back and uh, uh, for the online programs and uh, about 15 online programs including uh the short term that is 3 4 months and the 6 month and the one year uh, program um, uh, for the technicians paramedics nursing infection control nurse and you know the very good programs and they are in good demand and uh, uh, this is a milestone which has been achieved which uh, all of you uh, if you do not know we have a board like nabh similar board is there nabet so this is a great achievement by uh, astron for getting accredited for the first time in the country the astron institute uh, uh, last month has also uh, launched the e college and uh, e college is a very unique uh, you know uh, i should say uh, program of astron in which uh, we we have a number of videos recorded and uh, the the experts mostly from the health public health hospital as well as from the other fields recently we identified a professor from iim indore you know who is giving us uh, the 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 uh, e college videos on artificial intelligence in general as well as in health sector uh, with with examples applicable to health sector similarly we have nursing professionals we have the you know uh, finance accounts auditing we have on biomedical disease management so these are very useful uh, videos which are normally of one hour duration uh, with very useful ppts and the voice over you know so the experts uh, are introduced and then uh, the subjects are introduced and then uh, there is a presentation so i think e college has made a significant contribution in increasing the awareness of the candidates uh, on large number of areas we aim to you know astron is aiming to develop more than 100 such videos uh, very shortly so then uh, we come to the today's topic and that's the you know a very important topic uh, the patient safety in the intensive care unit and we have identified a very renowned uh, person resource person expert uh, in dr aklesh singh dr aklesh singh is the senior consultant let me take a few minute to introduce him he is a senior consultant uh, in the institute of critical care medicine at max super specialty hospital saket and he has also worked in the critical care uh, field in apollo hospital in the prastha apollo delhi and also the metro hospital noida and dr aklesh singh has got more than 20 years of experience in critical care medicine and uh, he has been successfully managing medical intensive care unit uh in these hospitals and uh, recently you know we have gone through a very bad pandemic uh, so he was uh, really in max this was a hospital which was so busy max super specialty saket and uh, he was among the few uh, senior consultant in critical care medicine who was working 24 hours so thank you very much uh, dr aklesh for looking after the pandemic uh, uh, you know cases and uh, that has earned good name for you as well as for the max super specialty hospital uh, and then uh, he is a very active member of the indian society of critical care medicine then there is another society esicm and then the sccm these are all uh, you know recognized internationally and affiliations with all western countries so this is a very good achievement uh, by being Uh, that dr aklesh is so active member of these institutions then you know he is also worked as faculty member in the college of critical care medicine mumbai and then uh, he has got lot of academic and scientific interest in fact he has published many research papers and publications 
to his credit, which are there. So I'm very happy to welcome you, Dr. Akhilesh, and without losing any more time because everybody is looking forward to your presentation. So over to you, Dr. Akhilesh. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the kind in, uh, the introduction. I would be, uh, the topic given to me is uh, patient safety in the intensive care unit. It's a very, very important topic. And uh, I will try to do the best of my uh, justice to this topic. Uh, shall I share the screen? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, is it visible here? Yeah? yeah, it is visible, sir. Thank you. So, uh, going to the topic patient safety in intensive care unit, uh, this is a topic of paramount importance. And as a healthcare professionals, we ought to understand the gravity of situation in intensive care unit and how we can keep the patients safe. Madam, it is not moving. Yeah. Thank you. So basically, it is the greatest challenge facing the healthcare industry today to deliver safer and care in complex, pressurized, and fast-moving environments. The most important of uh, the challenges is to prevent uh, in this field of patient safety must be how to prevent harm, particularly avoidable harms uh, during treatment and care. All preventable errors can and should be avoided. In order to achieve the high quality healthcare services, the safety of each and every patient deserves to be given the highest priority. To bring to your notice regarding the magnitude of this trouble, every year almost around uh, inadmissible number of patients suffer injuries or die because of unsafe or poor quality healthcare. Most of these injuries are usually avoidable. It is commonly reported that around 1 in 10 hospitalized patients experience harm with at least 50% preventability. There was a study which studied the frequency and preventability of adverse events across 26 low and middle income countries like ours. The rate of adverse event was around 8% of which 83% could have been prevented and 30% led to death. Almost around 421 million hospitalization takes place in the world annually and approximately 42.7 million adverse events occur in patients during this hospitalization. You must understand this is what it is actually. Uh, 42.7 million adverse events occurring in patients during hospitalization is something which we have to give a lot of importance to and try to prevent them. Because patient safety is a fundamental principle of healthcare. Despite this, medical error, errors are the third leading cause of death in the United States. On average, one incident of patient harm reported every 35 seconds in UK. In low and middle income countries, the combination of numerous favorable, unfavorable factors contribute to unsafe patient care, such as understaffing, inadequate structure and overcrowding, lack of healthcare care uh, commodities and shortage of basic equipments, poor hygiene and sanitation, weak safety and quality culture, flawed processes of patient care, and disinterested in leadership teams. So these all uh, variables constitute the reason behind the you know, uh, unsafe practice of uh, health care in our society. So patient safety is basically at the heart of healthcare. It depends upon the environment, the practitioner, the systems which constitute healthcare as well as the patient. So basically patient safety would depend upon the organizational culture, effective and efficient communication and a strong leadership. All of you must have uh, some of the way uh, traveled by air and we have a very common, uh, you know, uh, common, common things in between aviation industry as well as healthcare. There are also uh, engineering as human factors are, you know, combined. Fatigue and stress management is there. Effective communication, shared awareness is required, and teamwork. All these are required for a safe flight. And countermeasures for doing this is briefing, debriefing, workload distribution, 
gross monitoring, graded assertiveness, and checklists. You must be aware of that there are many checklists before a plane can fly. Similar thing applies to our healthcare industry and more so over to an intensive care unit for the safety of the patient. So going by this picture, uh, you can understand that this is an ICU bed, a patient on an ICU bed, and there are so many of uh, equipments around him. Slightest error in any of his equipment could lead to unfavorable outcome. This patient was on ECMO. He was connected. He was a case of uh, COVID-19 infection, and uh, he was hypoxic. He was put on an ECMO. He was on requiring ventilator support, multiple infusions for sustaining his blood pressure, and you know you can see the panel the amount of wires, gadgets going around this patient. So, with this picture itself, you can understand that in intensive care unit, slightest of error in any of these equipment or per se the infusions the drugs could lead to unfavorable outcome of the patient so our motto as healthcare professional is to maximize the safety of the patient and i will be touring you through how we can achieve that so intensive care unit is a favorable environment for occurrence of adverse events because of the complexity of the care provided severity of patients treated in these units and the work performed stressful conditions, involvement of multidisciplinary team. It is a self-contained area within a medical facility. It is equipped with high-tech specialized facilities designed for close monitoring, rapid intervention, and often extended treatment of a patient with acute organ dysfunction. The committed to the management of continuous monitoring of patients with life-threatening conditions. The aim of intensive care is to maintain vital functions in order to prevent further deterioration and reduce mortality and prevent morbidity in critical sick patients. Critical illness or injury is basically an acutely impairing one or more vital organs, such as there might be a high probability of imminent life-threatening deterioration in patient's condition. And intensive care or critical care is multidisciplinary and interprofessional speciality, specifically designed for management of patients at risk of developing or established life-threatening organ failures. Sometimes these patients may require the replacement of the failing organ system, particularly the lungs. May you may require the patient to put on mechanical ventilator. A cardiovascular failing may require a patient to put on IAPP or perform any other uh, uh, ECMO. And kidneys patient might require a dialysis. So these patients who are in intensive care unit might require n number of pro procedures as well as processes. And hence, these patients are very much vulnerable to, you know, errors. So patient safety would depend upon the medical safety, the surgical safety, the electrical safety, laboratory safety, sanitation, infection control, biomedical waste disposal, blood transfusion safety, equipment installation safety, and overall the environmental safety. None of the one of these has to be ignored. Each one of them plays a very, very deep role in maintaining the safety of the patient. So what is safety basically? Safety is an like acronym we have developed that you have to sense the error, act to prevent it, follow the safety guidelines, inquire into accidents and details, take appropriate remedial measures, and know your responsibility. So what is basically the reality of patient safety in the uh, healthcare system? According to the, uh, who is the most vulnerable? According to the Department of Health and Human Services, any patient actually admitted in intensive care unit is a vulnerable patient. More so other by this slide, which goes that almost roughly one out of six children entering any hospital this year will be a victim of an error. And how much this error costs? It was a study done in 2007 by the Institute of Health that recommended that medical errors cost the healthcare industry almost around 17 to 29 billion dollars each year. And what about the loss of life? That a study done in 2013 in Journal of Patient Safety noted that almost around 4,40,000 
the American patients will lose their lives this year due to preventable errors in the hospital. You can self imagine that in a developed country like America, almost around 440,000 patients are vulnerable to die due to preventable errors. So what can be the magnitude in a country like ours? And who are the most vulnerable? 97% of nurses say that the worry about a medication error on their watch. This is a very important slide. You must understand that patient safety due to medical errors or any other error or a preventable cause is something which is very, very important topic. So what are the challenges and the concerns? Because it is difficult to recognize error. Sometimes there are lack of information system to identify errors. Relationship of trust with providers, shortage of clinical professionals, concern about the liability, nobody wants to take liability, limited capacity on how to use quality improvement tools. There are quality improvement tools like PDSA, which are, they have very less knowledge about and they do not use it. And culture of patient safety is lacking, which is the power of need. This is what we, we require, the, the culture of patient safety. What are the commonest safety, patient safety issues? Healthcare acquired infections, such as superbug, sepsis, now it is, superbug is, uh, has been born in New Delhi itself. Or form of sense of improperly used disinfected med medical icon. Failure to diagnose, misdiagnosis or delayed diagnosis. Or vulnerability of the computerized yeah, yeah. medical devices. So the vulnerability of the computerized medical devices, the faulty devices might lead to a Fault in a device can lead to a life of a patient. Medication error, the wrong combination, wrong wrong dosage, or wrong medication. Yes, these are all uh, common patient safety issues. And what are about the risk management in patient safety? We have to account for the medication and errors and the harm, the readmissions to the ICU, infection rates, unplanned extubation or reintubations, or even deaths. So we have to go ahead and build a safe, safe, safe patient culture, build a safety culture, lead and support your staff. Professional development has to be done, uh, integrate your risk management activity. There should be a clinical performance and audit, involve the patients and learn and share the safety lessons. Culture is the way we do the things around. So for a, being, uh, applying a just culture, we should always share commitment to provide the safest care possible, shared commitment to sh learn from averse events, shared commitment to continue to improve, and the staff needs to be empowered to feel safe and to report and learn from the incident. They should not be, you know, uh, uh, made to uh, count their faults, rather they should be empowered and made to learn that whatever wrong has been done has to be rectified and not to be repeated. So beginning with the medical ICU, as you can see this door of my medical ICU, it says rest, entry restricted. Please scrub your hands before entering. No mobile use. And the white paper which uh, is stuck up there is, uh, says that the in view of pandemic, only one doctor from each unit is required, required to visit the ICU. So as you can see from the entrance itself, it is providing some information that this place is not a usual place. It, it is something different. And why it is different, it, these all things are being done for enhancing the patient safety. It can't be lived unmanned. As you can see a security in front of a, a medical ICU door. Why is the security there? Uh, why, why, why is, uh, is the security always uh, manning this door? In order for the patient safety, for the staff safety, as well as not, there should not be overcrowding in front so that the staff there can perform their duties adequately and efficiently. Rub your hands before entering. This is a very important uh, in today's scenario as almost, I think so, whole population has understood this that hand washing is a very, very important tool in prevention of the infections. So this is also a must thing, which we should understand that this is also meant for the safety of the patient. So coming to the equipment part, basically any, any uh, positive outcome uh, has three elements, basically the structure, the processes and the outcome. 
so the structure you should have a very well designed intensive care unit the floor should not be skidding the electrical panels should be you know proper there should be a good uh, uh, nursing station from where you can see all your patients properly and obviously uh, uh, there should be some fixed protocols which has to be followed in order to have maintain the dignity of the intensive care unit so for the device pass uh, part basically you should ensure that the devices are clean and decontaminated there should be no physical damage to the case the display or the mounts cards or components switches and controls are operable and correctly aligned labels and warning are present and legible the biomedical safety inspection sticker is not expired or missing the inlet and the hoses have no cracks rips or tears the power cord accessory cables the chargers are not marred damaged rusty or wet because these are all potential causes of fire in a intensive care unit the filters and the vents are clean and unobstructed as you must be all aware of that the joint commission recognized patient safety awareness week uh, this was done in 2022 just now recently and we should be following these thing and this has to be followed all across the healthcare including the intensive care unit the international patient safety goals there are six of them you have to identify the patient patients are identified always before on diagnostic procedures providing treatment and other procedures or providing food even food that is on dietary trays you should always understand that this is a very very crucial part in patient safety our right food has to go to the right patient right drug has to be delivered to the right patient there should not be any confusion and this has to be checked by the patient bands so we have different type of boy bands the there are usually two identifiers patient the white band goes for the uh, for the patient identification all patients in intensive care unit would be having this blue blue band why this blue band because this is a vulnerability patient who are vulnerable will have this band any patient who is allergic to something some medication or food have to have this red band and the gray band usually is for blood transfusions as you can see this patient has having the name uh, and his age and ip number as well as this violet band showing that the patient is vulnerable the hemovigil this is for the gray band the whosoever the patient uh, is supposed for a blood transfusion need to be applied this hemovigil band second uh, international patient safety goal is the effective communication so improve effective communication verbal and telephonic orders read back to the patient or the attendant confirm and record this is a routine practice the doctor phone kar deta hai bol deta hai order kar deta hai but it should end up you know there could be miscommunication and that might lead to you know a very adverse event or even internal event so hamesha always it is necessary that whenever you give a order on phone or you receive any order on phone you must always read back that that order okay and then record it critical lab values like high potassium level or low hemoglobin level needs to be reported from the lab to the concerned staff or the doctor and this has to be reported and documented there should be a very good com handover communication from both doctors and nurses during shift handovers and patient transfer this is a very important part of anybody's uh day to day activity healthcare day to day activity that handover and communication should be very very nicely done in order to have a very good continuity of care for the patient hence the patient safety obviously so keep it simple always you, you can see these two diagrams which one is simpler you should always keep this simple so that it can be understood nicely it improves efficiency improves the patient care keep yourself empowered and the continuity of information results in consistent reporting hand off tools it also promotes professionalism if you do not communicate properly or effectively it might lead to errors missing inform important information inaccurate information lack of continuity of care so this is as bar basically this is a tool which has been now very popular among the healthcare professionals as you must you guys must be knowing about it this is a situation background assessment and recommendation tool it is a sort of 
tool which uh, which every healthcare professional needs to imbibe in in, in him or her whenever you have giving information from to the other person because s stands for situation so you should say you should identify yourself identify your patient unit number patient's uh, id number if you require and a brief summary of what is the primary problem what happened to the patient just now then you go for background what the comorbidities of the patients are assessment of yours what did you assess how what were the findings you had and your recommendation this should be the sequence of event in which a patient's handover should be given to the another healthcare professional so we have designed some uh, 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 protocols in our icu like uh, this handover uh, checklist this i uh, asked the team leader to do that you should always have number of variables there and you can keep on adding on that and like the uh, sensorium of the patient what was the sensorium of the patient what were the vitals of the patient the is the patient on dvt prophylaxis or not or the central line artery line or all the any other line are working the hubs are clean or not what about the foley's catheter catheter is it fixed properly you have you given the catheter care in intercostal drainage are there on patients whether the drain is underwater seal is not there or not you know there are many of them hematoma of any side you whenever you have to mop the patient clean the patient you should always notice that at the insertion site of any of the lines is there some sort of hematoma it has to be reported what sort of vasopressor support this patient is having what are the glycemic control you know all these things have to be checked any changes during the day and yes or no should be that thing and you can have a remark ahead of that so this is a consent form any procedure before doing any procedure it has to be informed to the patient as well as to the family and all the complications have to be enlisted and the consent has to be taken before performing any procedure and usually we do it under ultras for the patient safety now nowadays it is recommended that you do in a ultrasound guidance only so this is a patient transfer out uh, checklist you have to have this chart and you have whenever you are giving from one department to another what were the changes of this patient you have to write and document everything going to the third and very important uh, ipsg goal that is to improve the safety of high alert medication in intensive care unit you use almost every day so okay. this this is an important very very important slide uh, ipsg goal 3 i mean in and out in the icu you have high alert medications whether it might be a concentrated electrolytes or uh, you know vasopressors or some medications like heparin any narcotics so all these are you know very if you uh, you know understand it very uh, in a layman term any of this medication has a very high potential of an adverse event if not done in a correct or protocolized manner so hence these patient, these medications should be have limited access and only cert concerned and designated personnel has access to these medications there are also look alike and sound alike medications there are concentrated electrolytes so identification labeling storage and proper use has to be done to prevent for prevention of inadvertent administration and a standardized protocol for electrolyte replacement therapy has to be in place in any intensive care unit these medications should be stored in under lock and key the high alert medication uh, this thing uh, label has to be put it has to be colored orange as you can see from that cabinet 1b similarly narcotics has to be uh, kept under double lock for the patient safety as well as for the staff safety as you can see that staff nurse is carrying this red bag and the key is like there this is basically meant for uh, there are two two personnel who have these keys one is this girl and one more the team leader two would be there both of them would be required to open that narcotic cabinet again all prescriptions should be written in capital letters only nowadays we use a, a computerized system like uh, hims health information systems but still we sometimes do have some uh, drug charts but the motto is that every medication has to be written in capital letters only and clear for the patient safety and for the uh, staff as well to understand well as you can see this is a syringe pump 
this is a noradrenaline going on it has been colored orange and there it is specifically mentioned how it has to be how much constituent is there um, and uh, you know it is depicting at what level it is going on sticker of high alert medication is set up i would come to the fourth uh, ipsg goal that is ensure correct site correct procedure and correct patient surgery this is also very very important in order to prevent any you know uh, and advert event uh, suppose a patient has to be operated upon left leg and in the, if it is not been done nicely properly he he can end up into operation of the other limb and it has occurred in the past so site marking has to be done by the person performing the procedure without involvement of the patient time out is another thing ot and invasive procedures by full surgical team and there there is a surgical safety checklist by who which has to be checked and there is a usually a procedure safety checklist for medical and dental procedures this is performed outside the icu as you can see here we have a checklist before performing the procedure and after the procedure and the names of the doctor and the technician this has to be filled in yes and no and you know uh, this has to be ensured that this is there with the consent form as well as this checklist before performing any procedure or any patient this is you know what i would say that unit of the intensive care unit this is basically a icu chart which contains all the information of the patient protocols which we have you know the and checklists which by just going through this if it is filled properly you will get all the information regarding the patient coming to uh, different protocols which we are needed for the patient safety like we have a glasgow coma scale which has to be filled which checks your neurological status of the patient slight deviation from you know uh, in in uh, this uh, scoring system will you know change your decision of the uh, physician what needs to be done suppose the glasgow coma scale basically is a neurological assessment tool the maximum is 15 and lowest is 3 but if the glasgow coma scale of a patient who which was 15 means mal means the patient was conscious oriented moving all his limbs you verbalizing properly it comes down to suppose 8 okay if this is variables given the scoring system this means that this patient has deteriorated and he might require an invasive ventilation so just by going through this uh, uh, charting it properly in on every in every shift on in, on any event also you can the the decision to for the treatment can change for the patient then we have a more fall risk which every system or the staff has to check that how, is there any probability of this patient to fall is uh, risk to fall then there is a sofa score sequential organs failure assessment score which Uh, properly and evaluated can tell you that whether this patient is uh, at a high risk of septic shock, and uh, and guide you for a uh, uh, proper therapy. This is basically nursing uh, uh, chart which uh, they document everything like from personal hygiene to positioning to suctioning to tracheostomy care and chest tube care, DVT pumps, dressings. They have to always assess it. And on every shift, every two hours, they check it and document. For uh, then we have a Braden scale for a pressure sore risk assessment that has to be filled. And another important tool is the pain assessment uh, scale. That is a visual analog scale which tells you whether the patient just by looking at that patient itself, giving them score from zero to ten, you can check out that whether this patient is in pain or not. And if the scale is on a higher side, you need to give a therapeutic intervention. Uh, even the drug is required sometimes fast hug bed is another tool uh, which we usually inculcate on patient for a safety profile and treating the patient it includes from feeding fluids analgesia patient is on analgesia or sedatives or easy on thromboprophylaxis or uh, head end is elevated or not is the patient because this is a very stressful situation for the patients easy on ulcer prophylaxis what is the glycemic control for the patient uh, many patients who are on mechanical ventilator whether we have given the spontaneous breathing trial to them what is the bowel care like how, how many days are the intervening catheter there whether it is mandated to remove the catheter 
and D is for drug de-escalation. Any patients who are on antibiotics have to be decided for drug de-escalation. Again, this chart enumerates you uh, pressure is over area. But just by looking at it, you can check the, whether the patient is having any uh, pressure, with which grade is it, whether it is progressing or it is healing. And the number, the devices which we are insert in the patient, like artery line or central line, how many days is it? Which site is it? And when was it removed? So it have, all is enumerated in this chart. So very, very important aspect. Uh, nowadays, we have we all understand that risk of infection in hospitals is a paramount uh, concern now. So IFSG 5 relates to reducing the risk of healthcare associated infection. The compliance to hand hygiene guidelines, evidence-based interventions such as bundles to apply the identified hospital acquired infection reduces uh, risk of hospital acquired infections like ventilator associated pneumonias, central line infections, catheter bundles, and compliance to the as you can see on this picture, anywhere in our hospital or in you know in the ICU, we have wherever the washing base, wash basin there where you wash hands. This chart has been depicted how to correctly do hand rub or hand washing. And this sequence has to be followed for an effective clean cleanliness of your hands. Five moments of higher energy all must be knowing before touching the patient, before cleaning, or doing any aseptic precautions after body fluid exposure or after touching the patient's uh, boundaries or after touching the surroundings. Even you need to follow these uh, five moments of higher energy. For the patient safety, we have these uh, few stickers for contact precautions, for airborne precautions, barrier nursing, droplet precautions. So this has to be hung uh, beside the patient in order to, uh, you know, uh, for the patient safety as well as for the staff safety. As you can see, patients usually are on uh, hemodialysis on the ICU. This patient uh, is a hepatitis B positive. So this has got a dedicated, they have got a dedicated machine. This machine is uh, supposed to be used only. If you use any other machine on this and that machine can be used on the, any other, other person might be the source of potential source of infection to that patient. So it has to be labeled and dedicated machine has to be used for a dedicated patients. Patients usually have, uh, uh, you know, neutropenic sepsis, they are, they are uh, neutropenic or, uh, you know, they require uh, barrier nursing. So these uh, PPEs have to be used, gown, masks, gloves and caps, you know, hand hygiene has to be performed and, you know, you have to have a proper disposable of these items in designated beds. Biomedical waste is another concern that has to be taken care of. As you can see, this staff is in a her PPE kit from gown, gloves, mask, cap, you know, everything she has done for this uh, uh, precautions for this patient. Then there are bundles, as I told you earlier, there are bundles like CRBSA bundle for uh, catheter related bloodstream infections, catheter associated urinary tract infection and ventilator, asso ventilator associated uh, pneumonias. So uh, this is a chart. Basically, you have to understand that in CRBSI, you have to understand that the, the line which has been inserted should be clean, the area should be uh, hygienic, and you know, uh, the pubs all should always be cleaned. The dressing should not be soiled. Uh, it has to be replaced if wet or soiled or dislodged. And you know, the hub should be scrubbed with the you know, alcohol swab before administration. And the daily review of the line has to be maintained. Similar goes with the uh, urinary catheter care. You have to follow the hand hygiene, aseptic technique has to be used. PPE kit, whenever is applicable, you have to maintain closed drainage system. It should not be opened anytime. It should be once you have fixed it, it should not be opened. The position of the euro bag should be at the bladder level at all the times and not to touch on the floor. And the tube should be properly fixed and maintained for maintenance of the unobstructed urinary flow. And perineal care should be done use of separate urine collection container for each patient and disinfect the container after use. Daily review of the catheter area has to be done and with prompt removal if not required. You should remove the catheter if the patient doesn't require it. 
similar goes with ventilator associated pneumonia the headline should be elevated for possible otherwise uh, almost around 45 degree to 30 degree has to be maintained oral care is very very important with chlorex clean and mouthwash to prevent ventilator associated pneumonia we use a closed suction while suctioning of the uh, endotracheal tube in order to least disconnection from the ventilator tube the we have to maintain endotracheal tube uh, pressure cuff pressure has to be maintained almost around 25 to 30 uh, peptic ulcer prophylaxis has to be done dvt prophylaxis has to be done and maintain sedation vacation once in 24 hours this is a mandatory thing additional to this in the pediatric population Properly position of oral or nasal gastric tube has to be done. Eliminate the rule rule of uh, uh, routine use of instill or suctioning. We should not always do that. And this has to be signed by each shift. I go to IPSG six now. That is the reduced reduction of the risk of patient harm resulting from falls. Uh, fall risk assessment has to be done. As I told you, more score is score is there. All inpatients has to be screened and in intensive care unit, these patients are, as I told you earlier, are vulnerable patients. All are vulnerable patients. They have a risk to fall. Initial ongoing reassessment of patient identified at risk of fall and implementation and monitoring of fall risk reduction measures. So what measures we have? So we have side rails. Always uh, suppose this, this is a bad, and this extra railing has been put in order to prevent uh, fall of the patient. Secondly, uh, whenever you are you are mopping, there should be a special mention of the caution that uh, is the floor is wet. Uh, patients might require restraint sometime after taking consent. There should be uh, there is always a uh, if the patient is hypothermic, we have device which can warm the patient. Crutches are there, and a doorbell. I mean, this bell is there in order for uh, you know uh, if some patient wants to uh, reach out to us. So. Otherwise, we are always around. But still, there are countless questions which are left unsettled. What are, we should always take into consideration? What are the indication of certain procedures for patient safety per se? You have to answer these questions before prior to performing the procedure. How often should this procedure be performed? What is the scientific knowledge that motivates a particular procedure? And obviously, you have to see the compatibility of the person who is doing that. What do we gain? And what do we risk? Should all the patients be treated in the same way or we have different patients have a different need of care? Does this need of care vary during the intensive care period? Should care be individualized regarding the suppose, for example, changing the position of the patient depending on the level of illness. If a patient is very sick, he is in ARDS, he has to be, you know, ventilated in prone position, you won't be, you know, changing the position. But yes, patient who is developing a pressure sore, you will, uh, he will be requiring a, a regular position changes. Similarly, we go for a DVT prophylaxis, ulcer prophylaxis, which have to be inculcated. We have it, uh, you know, uh, done in our in the, our place. We have put, especially, uh, you know, uh, whenever you put notes of some patient, you cannot proceed to the, after say 24 to 40, uh, 48 hours, you cannot proceed to write the notes because there will be a highlighter which will be asking you a question whether DVT prophylaxis for this patient has been given or not. Because these patients are vulnerable patients or hospitalized patients. They have a potential to de develop deep venous thrombosis. So until unless you answer that question, you won't proceed further to write the notes. They, the computer won't let you do that. So this has reduced the risk of pulmonary embolism in our, our facility to a very much a large extent. Because every healthcare professional has to undergo that thing and they will do something about it. Whenever this is highlighted, whether this is you will give it a chemical pro pro prophylaxis or a mechanical prophylaxis, hence it has uh, saved many patients from developing deep venous thrombosis or a pulmonary embolism. The endotracheal tube should be fixed properly. Uh, same goes with the uh, feeding tube. And uh, as you can see on this picture, the central line has a, you know, you should put it in a clean, uh, uh, you know, cloth and the site has to be uh, uh, dressed in a transparent manner. Uh, you have to keep the insertion site visible, bleeding and check for bleeding and swelling or inflammation. Uh, this is basically a venturi mask. This is an oxygen delivery mask. This 
enables you this color coding enables you to give a graded oxygen you know a patient of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease might not be requiring saturation of 100% okay and you might be without uh, with this device you can give a graded oxygen therapy to the patient not to develop hypercapnia how much oxygen is required that much flow is given this is a venturi mask basically we have uh, uh, you know on talking walls basically we have stickers ensuring that you know to the staff reminding them you need to change the position of the patient in hourly manner then there is a needle stick injury as see this is a basically sleeping threat to needle uh, healthcare workers uh, how you what you do to do what you do not know not to, to do no recapping iv cannulation technique splash prevention proper biomedical waste segregation proper use of insulin pen needle and proper sampling techniques to prevent the needle stick injury as you can see from this picture endotracheal tube tubing has to be fixed i mean this should not be bagging around pulling the endotracheal tube you might land up into dislodgement and similar goes with the arterial line you know there is a labeling that this is a arterial line and you have to label it and uh, the pressure cuff has to be monitored and always safety first sticker has to be on at every bedside needle stick injury prevention kit is there uh spill kit is there and obviously uh, you have to uh, dispose the waste biomedical waste in segregated bins for so yellow red uh, blue and white uh, accordingly as you must be knowing all of you must be knowing that where which waste has to go fair safety is another important aspect basically uh, you have to have uh, for the patient safety as well as for the staff safety you have to have a map of uh, your uh, unit which depicts the fire exit there should always be fire extinguisher at the reachable site race and passes are the things which are mandatory for every healthcare worker to know and there is in case of fire there is a you know uh, equipment available with uh, you know helmet and stretchers which will help the patient uh, evacuation of the patient from the uh, fire area this emergency code response has to be depicted everywhere in case of uh, violence in case of uh, poor unresponsiveness of a patient there are different codes available which can help you uh, you know uh, gather the team which may help you in treating that patient similarly hypoglycemic there should be protocolized way of administration of drugs uh, there is a hypoglycemic protocol there is a coagulation rhabdomyolysis protocol there are different protocols for each and everything which helps up dedicated and proper care of the patient and ensuring the patient safety so the care should be patient should be provided uh, patient centered care and services patient is the focus of our practice employ evidence based laboratory practice to provide critical effective health care apply quality improvement principles to healthcare processes to reduce the error opportunity and use informatics as essential component in treating the patient and provide uh, you know expertise information from professional healthcare teams to develop and implement standards of care start yeah so i bring you to one of the papers which is very important uh, uh this is basically an article which was published in way back in uh, 2015 that nurses worry or concern an early recognition of deteriorating patients on a general ward in acute care uh, healthcare settings this uh, the result of this uh, study was that you know the signs and symptoms we found in the literature reflect the nature of worries Uh, of nurses worry or concern and nurses may incorporate these signs in their assessment of the patient and their decision to call for assistance the fact is that it is present even before changes in vital signs suggest that the potential for improving care in a early stage deterioration that what it says is that you know the only worry per se of the nurse towards the patient is should not be ignored it has to be taken into account and probably this might help in you know treatment of the patient early treatment of patient uh, the patient should not go develop uh, severity rather so as you can see there are ten variables ten indicators change in breathing change in circulation temperature impaired mentation agitation pain 
you know subjective nurse observation and knowing without a rational event gut feeling and not knowing something is wrong this in itself should be indicated it should be included in care of the patient if the staff who is taking care of the patient feels that this patient doesn't look good to me so to, for the safety of the patient this has to be taken into account and acted upon i have discussed basically i am concerned i am uncomfortable this is a safety issue so this should be a closed loop com uh, uh, communication and it has to be acted fast you have to notice notify the team whenever the family is concerned there is any acute change in mental status or respiratory issue or acute coronary sepsis staff member is worried and when your doctor is not uh, taking responsive so you can always call the code blue team early assessment early detection and early intervention is the key critical events are always preceded by warning signs much you know 6 to 8 hours prior to actual event and 70% of the patients who experience circulatory problems demonstrate respiratory issues much before 8 hours before leading to event itself so it should not be ignored at all there are 84% of patients who develop cardiac arrest have been unstable within 8 hours before this has to be taken into account that you have to early assess early detect and early intervene developing a positive patient safety climate uh, leads to reduction of in hospital mortality length of stay and rate of healthcare associated infections positive factors may be because of good management managerial actions collaborative efforts jobs it may lead to job satisfaction quality of work environment and logistical support improving the competence of the nurse is also required so uh, we have to aim target for zero harm have a good vision develop trust and respect and inclusion there should be a board engagement leadership development should be there and there should be a just culture with a good behavior expectation as you i as i started in beginning what leads to bad you know patient outcome are these few uh, parameters and just by replacing these words may help you achieve what is actually required okay so you should have advocate staffing advocate structures and uh, structures which should uh, deprive overcrowding good health care comment commodities and there should not be any shortage of this uh, shortage of this should be standard hygiene and sanitation a strong safety and quality culture and effective uh, processes of care and strong and inspiring in leadership teams so audits are required uh, audits always teach us where we are wrong and that has to be implemented so patient improving patient safety culture will, uh, you should understand what are your results of your audits implement action plans and track progress and evaluate impact and share thanks thank you very much dr akhilesh wonderful presentation actually i think before uh, i formally uh, thank you and conclude uh, i would like to uh, maybe follow me should we ask uh, should we leave it to the uh, i mean should we leave should we have some questions uh, from the students or an, any other member yes we can have a you know short question answer session sir okay so uh, anybody has any questions uh, they can raise the questions and, or they can fax it or you know immediately whatsapp it to uh, ms palomi or to anybody so please let us know your questions if you have any well then uh, dr akhilesh uh, can i ask you that in your max uh, hospital uh, what was the what was the incidence uh, of the patient safety uh, you know errors or the adverse events uh, till about say 5 years back and how are you uh, going along uh, of course leaving aside the last two years pandemic how has been uh, uh, because you know the, we often hear that our uh, the clinicians and surgeons and other people try to sweep the issues under the carpet and there is no voluntary reporting and many of the nurses and doctors try to hush hush the you know errors committed by them so we should have some culture of uh, you know uh, where they can come out openly without any you know uh, fear of punishment so any steps being taken in max hospital in this regard 
yes sir uh, basically uh, if you go back to the last decade i would say uh, yes the, uh, the jci and the nibh started coming in uh, to the hospitals actually and prior yeah. to that there were many many you know adverse event sentinel and events even which were occurring but by inculcating these policies of jci as well as uh, nbh which has become yes. now a, a mandatory for every hospital the incidence of you know adverse event definitely has come down but it has not been elevated completely yes Still, there are yes. many adverse events sir and i in my icu usually uh, make sure that this incident is reported and this incident is not reported in order to punish the staff or something like that but it has to be for a statistical purpose as well as you know for teaching the staff yes so, i agree uh, with you yeah, incident, go ahead, go ahead. incidents yeah. incidents ahead. like uh, incidents like you know accidental removal of the endotracheal tube or accidental removal of the intercostal drainage you know these incidents do occur because sometimes the patient is so violent they may my may not have restrained the patient sometimes these do occur in intensive care unit but yes by implementing these policies of nbh these these goals sir we have come down to a much uh, better uh, you know uh, scenario now thank you very much i think yes, uh, uh onomi no other questions then i can uh, you know make few more points and then uh, thank dr Okay. I'm sorry, sir. I I took a little longer. I thought I would. No, no, it's okay. But, but your presentation was very nice, uh, lucid, exhaustive, and pertinent. You know, uh, doesn't make you know doesn't matter at all because more the merrier, as we say. I'm trying. Follow me. If no questions, can I conclude it? Yes. No, sir. No, sir. Okay. Then uh, I think Dr. Nakesh Singh has very nicely brought out. Uh, uh, you know, the old hypocrites uh, said. More than 2,500 years ago, uh, do no harm, and he started by that, and then he said that one out of ten admitted patient undergo one or the other adverse events, and more than 60% of these adverse events are preventable. So we have to see to it that the culture of patient safety, as he has presented, uh, is practiced, and then he also compared. <clears throat> that you know when you board a aircraft aviation safety more than more than a thousand checks are being carried out you know uh, before uh, the aircraft is airborne and similar kind of checks you know um, uh, if they are done in our hospitals some hospitals like max you know is known for patient safety but mostly our hospitals are not uh, following those thorough checks and that leads to a lot of adverse events so this is uh, and then he also explained about uh, safety you know what is s stands for a stands for f and e and p y all those things and then he also you know dwelt at, at length with the six patient international patient patient safety goals including the fall you know last one and uh, various other uh, high critical things in the intensive care unit so with this i think uh, dr akhilesh really Uh, we look forward to more and more such presentation from you and thank you very much for uh, you know uh, helping us at astron um, uh, you know for for this wonderful webinar we have, we are going, we have already recorded it and then maybe we can share it with you later on thank you so much my pleasure my pleasure thank, thank you, you. Dear, thank you